This is Greg Luck. If you're unfamiliar, he's a televangelist, a hate preacher, a nutter butter of epic proportions. Well, he came out here not too long ago on his little stage and announced that he's shifting gears. He's shifting to a ministry that's more focused on exercising demons from people. He's about to defend his decision to go into exorcism ministry, basically and his claim that there are demons around every corner. As it turns out, Greg Locke deleted his most viral Facebook videos not too long ago. So he's really switching gears. He's switching to be like, a, I don't know, a pastor that is absolutely obsessed with demon possession. He seems to believe that demon, that anything, that any ailment that you have, any issue in your life, including but not limited to high blood pressure, is the result of a demon and can be cured, including high blood pressure, by simply praying it away. That's all you got to do. Pray the high blood pressure away. And while we listen to this, we are going to play some Breath of the Wild too. I'm just kind of going around grinding, so, yeah. Jesus only one. Shout one. Only one time. In three and a half years of preaching every day, casting out demons every day, healing people every day, fighting religious lunatics every day, there is only one time that Jesus... Oh, dude, please don't tell me Greg's going to start crying again. Is he going to start crying again? Ever said, I am something. Why is he crying? What's he crying over? I don't understand. Again, I have no problem with people crying. They're per perfectly fine with me. Cry. That's what you want to do. But at least, like, what is he doing? Why? What is the reason? You must have a reason, right? The dude cries every single sermon, basically. It's just weird to me that he cries so much constantly over nothing. There's nothing to cry about here. That I can be. There is only one I am statement from the lips of Jesus in red letters that definitively gives me permission to be the same thing. For example, we're getting... Wait, are you just going to tell me or are you going to give me an example? Tell me what it is. What's the I am statement you can be? There, but you got to hang with me for a minute. We know that Jesus is love. God is love. But Jesus never gave that character description of himself. Jesus never one time said, I am love. But we Okay, fair enough, I suppose. We know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But Jesus never claimed to be love. Jesus never said, I am holy. That's a character expression. But we know he's holy. And he said in Matthew 5, 22, Be ye therefore perfect, even as my Father in heaven is also perfect. Well, actually, it's kind of interesting he says this. What, what kind of a character trait is holy? How does one be holy as Jesus? That's weird, right? Jesus never said, I am forgiveness. Although we know Ephesians 4.32 says that we are to forgive one another for Christ's sake. We know that he is forgiveness, but Jesus never said, I am forgiveness. He never made that character relation. He never said, I am judge. I am judgment. We know he is. We know he will be the final judge. And yet he still says, judge not lest you be judged, which, by the way, is not a... By the Yeah, let me just point this out. He's talking about Jesus being the judge. That's a description of the Son of Man, which is the Messiah of the Old Testament. The Son of Man of the Old Testament was supposed to come along, take political control of the country of Israel, and then you know, spark Armageddon, bring about the end. That was the expectation. But uh, that never happened. Jesus died before he could fulfill that role. So his, uh, his apostles and disciples and whoever else were confused. They're like, uh, he'll be back. He'll be back. Just wait and see. Let's just chill out and wait, and, uh, and then he'll come back and he'll judge everybody. No, he just didn't fulfill the role. Like, he died first. Did you, did you not catch on to that? Turns out he was not the son of man. Anyways, that, that's what he's saying here. 
darkness. He never made that character. Or I'm sorry, that's what he's referencing here, not saying. That's what uh, Greg Locke is referencing here. Relation. He never said, I am judge. I, I am judgment. We know he is. We know he will be the final judge. And yet he still says, judge not lest you be judged. Which, by the way, is not a context to not judge. It's a context to judge righteously because how you judge, you'll be rejudged. He says, get the law, get the telephone pole out of your own eye before you start jumping around on Facebook trying to get splinters and toothpicks out of everybody else's eye, right? Well, it's interesting that he's pointing this fact out. This is usually a verse that he likes to completely ignore and pretend is not like in the Bible, like judge not lest ye be judged. Well, that's like all this guy does is talk about how gay people are evil and all this other stuff. That's how he got famous was talking about hating gay people what he means by that but jesus never made any single solitary demonstrative what does he mean when he's saying demonstrative it means demonstrate that's like it's another tense of the word demonstrate why does he keep saying demonstrative it makes no sense in this context he says get the law get the telephone pole out of your own eye before you start jumping around on facebook trying to get splinters and toothpicks out of everybody else's eye right that's what he means by that but jesus well, that's what he actually said. Yeah, basically. Jesus never made any single solitary demonstrative things in the Bible saying, here is what my character is. Uh, okay. I don't think he, uh, yeah. I guess I don't complete sentences all the time, I suppose. I, I literally just didn't complete like three of them, so. <laughs> I am patient, but we know he's patient. I am generous. We know he's generous. He never said it. There's only one time. <laughs> one time. That Jesus told me what his heart was. He's crying again. What's he crying about? I don't understand. Why is he so emotional? I just want to know what he's emotional over right now. That's all. Just once. Matthew 11, verse 28. Okay, this was apparently the thing that he was leading up to, Matthew 11, 28. So he gave us the I am statements from the book of John. Jesus is the Messiah, all right? Come unto me, all ye that labor. By the way, he's assuming that you're doing that. We're working for the kingdom. We're not just sitting around. When, when, when the Bible says, you know. No, that's not what that verse is talking about. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. It says, basically, everybody who's working their ass off and you have heavy burdens on you. So he's talking about anybody. He's talking about the working class. Anybody who's from the working class, come to me. He's not talking about working for the kingdom or, or any of that stuff. He's trying to include rich people in this when Jesus very clearly did not want to include rich people, right? Oh, Terry, when the Bible says wait and watch, it doesn't mean you sit soaking sour and do nothing. It means you work while Jesus is still on his way back. So he says you come on. There's the go, go, go guy again. Oh, my God, dude. That guy is like really annoying. To me, all ye that labor, now watch this, and are heavy laden. You ever felt heavy? Sure you have. There's a spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61, verse 4. We put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We know that it's there. We know it's a reality. We know that sometimes marriage is heavy. Sometimes life is heavy. So he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what will he do? He will give you rest. Notice, he will not give you rebuke. He'll do it when you need it. But in that context, when you're tired, when you're beat up, when you're beat down, when you're under persecution, because yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said, here's the one thing you need. You need rest. Okay, so when you suffer persecution, you need rest. Well, he's already misinterpreting this verse. The verse was intended to be interpreted as, you know, helping the poor feel better about their situation or, or get better or whatever. It was not about what Greg is portraying here at all. And the reason some of you are about to have a mental, emotional breakdown is because you don't rest in him. Seems like Greg's the one that's about to have a mental and emotional breakdown. Seems like he's like right in the middle of one. 
He is your rest. But that's not even the message. Because check this out, verse 49. Take my yoke upon you. Now, you know that a yoke is a, is a dual headdress, if you will, where two ox, oxen would get in. You have one on one side, one on the other. Right, left, left, right. And they would both get in. And they would bear the brunt of the heavy load, the laden burden together. Wasn't one ox doing it, it was two. So here's Right, yeah, see, yeah, that's, that is a correct description. So it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls. Um, okay, so Jesus is telling people to basically learn from him and rest your issues on him or or is he saying he wants to rest his issues on you i'm not really sure that's kind of a weird way of saying it for for i am meek and lowly in heart seemingly that jesus is encouraging that personality trait being meek and lowly of heart right if you will where two ox oxen would get in you have one on one side one on the other right left left right and they would both get in and they would bear the brunt of the heavy load, the laden burden together. Wasn't one ox doing it, it was two. So here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, we gonna yoke up. Okay, yes. We gonna hook up. Uh, I think that, yeah, I don't think Jesus meant that, but okay. We gonna go side by side, heart to heart, head to head, neck to neck, and here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna pull with you. Now, by the way, he's gonna do most of the pulling. But he said, take my yoke upon you. Now, the average person read that and say, my goodness, I, that's slavery. I don't want to be in a yoke. You better get yoked up with him. Uh, the average person would say that? I, <laughs> God, he's so weird and nonsensical. Like, everything that he says is just, it's like, it's all built on a faulty premise. It's all built on nonsense, like all of it. It's built on his terrible interpretation of the bible which leads him to bizarre conclusions you better get there's a go 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 guy again robert adds that correctly points out a yoke can be singular not always in pairs yeah that's you're right absolutely kind of a weird thing to say right the hell yoked up with jesus because you can't carry the load that's coming by the by i don't know if you see what i'm doing in uh, the the game here but these ghost warriors here um, they spawn in when you get close enough. So they spawn in with really useful weapons uh, that are not decayed. They're called pristine weapons in this game, which are really, really hard to find. And if you just keep reloading before the ghost warrior spawns in, you can spawn better weapons, basically. So I keep walking up and checking to see, and this is a traveler's... Uh, a traveler's sword. I can tell because the bottom is shaded. On a nor and the point is kind of uh, less rounded. On a different sword, it's got a different handle and a different everything. So I just keep reloading until I get what I'm looking for here. He said, "Take my yoke upon you." Now watch, please, what's about to happen because things are about to get crazy in the text. He said, "Here's why you need to take my yoke." He said, "And in doing so, here's what you will do." and learn of me. The Greek phrase, I'm not trying to impress you, but I gotta teach you some stuff. The Greek phrase, learn of me, literally reads, learn from me. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. Um, I don't really care that much. I have no problem accepting that. It's just, I don't like taking anything from Greg Locke. I don't like taking a single word for granted like i don't trust anything that this dude says not one word so be extremely skeptical of even the most basic trivial facts he gives you how many of you know the greatest teacher on the planet is jesus through the inspiration and power of the holy spirit no scriptures of any private interpretation you don't get to say well this is what it means to me and that's what it means to you no the bible is not a buffet it means what god said it meant no matter how it makes you feel well it is actually a buffet because there are there's such a massive variety of different verses all through the entire book because they were it was, you know, what, 32,000 verses, 66 books written over the course of 3,000 years by dozens of authors that all had varying 
positions of authority and wealth and fame and whatever, all of the books of the Bible contradict each other, basically. It's like, if you find one moral prescription in the Bible, it's reversed a chapter later, 99% of the time. So the Bible is actually like a buffet. So like, there's no other way to take the Bible. And so he says, I want you to learn from me. I want you to learn of me. So here's the next question then. If he wants me to learn of him, if he wants me to learn from him, what am I supposed to learn? What am I learning? What school of hard knocks am I in? What do you want to teach me if you are my teacher and he is? If you command that I learn of, literally from you, then how am I going to learn? How am I going to learn if you don't tell me what the curriculum is? And then out of nowhere... Get this, for the first and last, for the one and only time, Jesus is going to speak of himself through a character reference. And this is in the book of Matthew, right? I think that's what he's reading from right now. Um, I think it, it's pretty obvious to everybody that, like, the reason that he's finding this here rather than anywhere else is because the book of John had very specific ideas about who and what Jesus was, and the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were different. They did not view Jesus in the same way. But okay, continue. That we get to example and emulate. Because I am none of those other things. But I can be the next I am phrase that comes out of his mouth. How do we learn of him? Buckle up. Here it is. Four. Here's the next two words. I am. Say that out loud. Here we go. I am. Say it again. I am. One more time. I am. Jesus just said that. That's red letters in your Bible. It's not Greg letters. Red letters, not Greg letters. God, is he just cringy dude what he's about to say is the only time that he ever revealed himself in character form he never said i'm this i'm this i'm this. no no he only said so he said in the book of matthew i'm meek and lowly in heart that was one of his character descriptions right so the other I am statements that Greg was talking about earlier were where Jesus was calling himself the Messiah in the book of John, which is found nowhere else in any of the other Gospels. This one is just saying, well, I'm meek and lowly in heart. I'm just describing who I am, not claiming to be the Messiah or whatever. That's why it's different. I am meek. And watch this. Lowly in heart some of you have a rendition that says humble at heart that's the best translation because that's exactly what it means dude can you can you make out che uh, tears on his cheeks let's just step back and really zoom into this puppy Lee in heart Watch the shine as he turns his head here. Some of you have a rendition that says humble at heart. That's the best translation. Because that's exactly what it means. There, there, yes. I can see it clear as day. He's got a shine on his cheek. He's literally crying. What is he crying over? Why is he crying? I don't understand. This is just bizarre, man. I am the door. Okay, I'm not. I am the resurrection. That's cool. I can't be. I am the alpha, the omega. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. That's fantabulous. I believe it. Slam dunk. I can't be any of those things. Jesus could have said, I am patience. I am generous. I am kind. I am loving. I am whatever. And he's all of those things. But he chose to tell us to be taught and to learn from 
one definitive characteristic of God. Actually, Jesus didn't pick what went in the book because it was written like 35, 40 years after he died, wasn't it? The people that wrote it, which, by the way, was not Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, for the record. The people that wrote it told you what they wanted to know about Jesus. They told you his character traits. Dude is alive for 33 years, okay? Uh, matter of fact, I just passed Jesus in age, come to think of it. I was 30, or I'm 34 now, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. I'm sure in his, you know, 33 years, Jesus said all of this stuff about himself. Because that, that's like the impression he wanted to give people. But the Bible writers chose to put that in specifically. I am meek and humble at heart. You know what meekness is? Yes, humble. It means humble, basically. I, I used to define it as strength under control. And there's certainly a lot of validation to that. There is strength that needs to be harnessed just because validation what, what does he mean there's a lot of validation in that as you can does not mean that you should but i think maybe the holy spirit has revealed to me just a bit of a a better more biblical applicable definition of what meekness is here's the real definition of meekness it's ability robed in wisdom ability robed in wisdom um okay It's ability. I've got the ability to crush you. But in wisdom, I reserve myself. Okay, there were a lot of things that he could have chosen as an example. Why did he choose, I have the ability to crush you as the example that he went with? What a bizarre thing to pick. It's like, are you really thinking about crushing people all the time? Why would anybody want that ability anyways? I've got the ability to show strength. But wisdom tells me to slow my roll. You follow me? Sure, I suppose. We have to get through the meekness part because we got to really get into the lowly and hard part. So we've raised a generation of people that have confused meekness with weakness. But in the grand scheme of things, Moses was the meekest man in the Bible, and nobody would say that Moses was consumed with weakness. Matter of fact, Moses wasn't a real person. Um, it was a fabrication, and there was no 40-year journey across the desert. That, that's also a fabrication, for the record, if you were unaware. Uh, me Just read about it. Just look into it. There's absolutely zero evidence to imply that Moses existed, and there should be. Men, especially, that are consumed with a lack of meekness are the weakest people in society right. it's okay to know that you've got more in the tank it's okay to know that you walk in authority that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover you can tread on serpents and scorpions and you can say to demons come out in the name of jesus it's okay to walk in that level of authority but you have to learn to harness authority because unharnessed authority will destroy the people that you minister to Oh, this is interesting. So Greg Locke is basically saying it's wrong to act like an alpha male. Am I reading this correctly? That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, he put a bunch of time and effort into the man plan, quote unquote. It's like a 10 step plan over the course of the month you're supposed to do to be a real man to kind of draw in those Andrew Tate followers or subscribers or whatever. And now he's saying don't act like an alpha, quote unquote. Don't act like a, a jag off, if you will. That's J A G. J A G O F F. Or it will destroy you from the inside out. Because arrogance and authority are two very different things, and only one of them has been given as a gift from the Holy Ghost. Interesting. Um, yeah, it sounds like he's kind of condemning the alpha male viewpoint. I can't imagine that all of his audience members are really happy with that interpretation. 
Arrogance is a fruit of my flesh. Authority is a fruit of the Holy Spirit when I've been baptized in his mercy and grace and his power, right? So demons don't care how anointed we think we are. Demons are only afraid at how authoritative we truly are when we walk in wisdom. Now, we've all walked in our life in a lack of wisdom. We've done it in our marriage. We've done it with our kids, with our grandkids. We do it in church. We do it in ministry. We've done it financially. Sure, I suppose. Everybody has made bad decisions. Is that what he's saying? We've done it. We've made poor health choices. All of us have walked in a lack of wisdom. James 1, 5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. You know what? God will give you wisdom and not rebuke you for asking because it's the number one thing you need in life. So of all the character descriptions, and really it's, it's the same description. He's, he's saying two things the very same way. He's kind of coming in the back door. He says, I'm meek. I, I've got the ability, but my ability is robed in wisdom. I've now remember... Coming into this, this whole sermon was about Greg Locke, quote unquote, shifting gears, changing the way that he operates, changing his viewpoint on everything, on the Bible, on Jesus, on how you're supposed to act and the things you're supposed to do, the whole nine yards. So Greg Locke, you know, he's famously acted like a jag off like the quintessential alpha male, quote-unquote, you know, um, Andrew Tate-style person. And now he's shifting gears. He says, apparently, it's better to be meek and uh, humble and kind and, and stuff. And the even more fascinating thing about it is that he deleted a bunch of his Facebook, his viral Facebook posts before doing the sermon. Like the day that he gave this, he deleted a ton of his viral Facebook posts. Isn't that interesting? I've got more in the tank. I've got some strength, but I've got to be meek with some people. I know Jude says that you pull some people out of the fire, hanging even the garment that is spotted by the flesh and by sin. But then he says, and of others, save with compassion. What that means is wisdom will tell you the difference of when somebody needs to be reached through a hug and when somebody needs to be reached because they need to be thumped upside the head. And there's both of those types of people. Wisdom will tell you when to thump and when to thump not. When to thump and when to thump not, okay. That's meekness. Meekness is knowing when you put your foot on the gas pedal, there's more under the hood. But you reserve yourself. You know, I don't know about anybody else. I don't know about Greg Locke. But this whole alpha male thing is so stupid to me. Let me tell you why. I have always, since the very beginning, like my entire life basically, always, always tried to mask my level of intelligence, my capability in any situation. I would rather people underestimate me then overestimate. You know, I would rather people underestimate and think I'm an idiot. Boris Johnson does the same thing, come to find. I didn't know this about him until I saw him trying to open an umbrella. Any moment now we'll be celebrating with the fly past of the National Police Air Service, so we'll just wait a moment on them. It was just ridiculous. Anyway, Boris Johnson, um, ex-leader of, uh, you know, the, the UK, the prime minister, ex-prime minister of the UK, did this exact same thing. Like, he acted like a fool. Now, I don't act like a fool. I just don't let on how much I know or whatever. This, the, the entire idea behind this alpha male thing is that you act stronger than you actually are. I'm like the exact opposite. I act weaker than I actually am. Why are these people like this? Maybe Greg Locke caught on to 
the fact that that's the better way to go. I don't know. For a better opportunity. <clears throat> For a more spiritual purpose. All that to say, go back to the text, because this is really what I want to get to. Learn of me. Learn from me. Learn who I am. Who is he? I'm meek and humble at heart. I'm lowly in heart. Question, did he have to be that? No, absolutely not. He was Jesus. He was God in the flesh. But the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, not the form of a leader. If you want to be a leader, you've got to first be a servant because the best leaders are servants. Not Okay, no, I, I completely disagree. You don't have to be a servant, quote unquote, to anybody. I hate this, like, master-slave dichotomy that, extreme christians seem to have on stuff it's it's really really weird is it just me like um my dad was a lot like this he's obsessed with controlling the people around him and believed that he deserved that to be able to control people because he was the one in authority he's the alpha you know i mean the, the word alpha didn't really exist back then that in the way that it does today but you know, that's how my dad acted. He acted like a, a quote-unquote alpha male or whatever, like Andrew Tate kind of, I guess. Not the form of a leader. If you want to be a leader, you got to first be a servant because the best leaders are servants, not dictators. Yeah, so I don't get the whole, like, dichotomy of everybody has to be a servant at some point or you should be a servant or whatever. It's just weird. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, comma, he humbled himself. Think about that. He, Jesus, humbled himself. You see, humility is a choice. It, it, it's not a spiritual gift. Oh, it opens up giftedness. It can become a spiritual curse if you deny it. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And by the way, you always know when someone is walking in true humility, when they observe true obedience, no matter how difficult the task is. They're serving not to be seen. They are serving because they've been sent. I don't understand. Is this just complete nonsense to anybody else? They're serving not to be seen, but what What did he say? When someone is walking in true humility, when they observe true obedience, no matter how difficult the task is. They're serving not to be seen. They are serving because they've been sent. They're serving because they've been sent. Okay. So he's saying people who are like, if you're meek like Jesus, you won't serve because you won't serve somebody as a like in a master slave relationship quote unquote because you think it's the right thing to do but because you want to be seen like there's that dichotomy some people do it to be seen and recognized as like good or whatever and others do it because they they just think it's right okay you got a lot of people that enjoy being seen in the body of Christ, but some people need to just rejoice and walk in humility, and they may have the biggest and best gift in the room, but they're not using it to be seen. They're using it because they've been sent on assignment by the Holy Ghost. And so I, I find it just extraordinarily fascinating that out of all the things Jesus said, which really in the grand scheme of things, if you took the red letters of Jesus and put them all in a book, it'd be a very small manual. It would, yeah. Um, Jesus really did not, you know, they didn't quote Jesus very much in the Bible. It's very, very little. Uh, he's correct about this, interestingly. And then uh, Paul and lots and lots of others came along and, you know, added to it and changed it and kind of created Christianity. To my knowledge, Paul never even met Jesus, right? I, I, don't, I believe that they never met. But he's the one that really formed out what Christianity would eventually become.
fascinatingly. In fact, I could be wrong, so don't quote me, but I think the Catholic Church considers Paul to be the first pope. And so they believe that it's, you know, Christianity started and they start counting from there. Kind of ridiculous, but anyway. That out of all the things Jesus said, which really in the grand scheme of things, if you took the red letters of Jesus and put them all in a book, it'd be a very small manual. It, it would look like the deliverance manual. We think Jesus said an Encyclopedia Britannica worth of stuff. He did that we don't know. Wait a minute. Did he just say deliverance manual? Is that what I just heard? Does he have a deliverance manual that I've been, that I'm not informed of? Oh my God, he does. Oh my God, he does. He's got the deliverance handbook. Oh boy. Oh, you bet I'm going to download this puppy. Oh, wow. Oh my God. Renunciation. Wow, dude, this is really bizarre. Oh, dude, I, I must cover this. I didn't know this existed. This is a list of things that Greg Locke tells his people that they should renounce. Red door, yellow door. Um, black and white magic, witchcraft, Wiccan, wizards, psychic readings, psychic prayers, enchantments, spells, fortune telling, tarot cards, water witching, whatever the f that is. Necromancy, divination, slash python. Is that a new programming language I'm unfamiliar with? Divination? Potions, Ouija boards, Zozo. What the hell is Zozo? Crystal Balls, Bloody Mary, The Bell Witch, Charlie Char... What, the, what are all these things? And wh why does he... Why is he so obsessed with this stuff? This is just... This is fascinating, dude. I love it. Light as a feather, stiff as a board? Reiki therapy? Yeah, Reiki is fake, by the way. It's like reflexology. It's just fake. Martial arts is in here. Not allowed to do that. Okay. Hypnosis. Astral projection. Shape shifting, palm reading, clairvoyance. Wow. See, the interesting thing about this, this is why I call Greg Locke witches for Jesus from time to time. He believes that he has all of these powers, but he gets his power from God rather than from Satan, which is where witches get the power to do all this stuff. Yin Yang is on the list of evil things. Okay. <laughs> Crystals, oath slash covenants. Religious spirits. We've got a, a list of religious spirits here. Eastern mysticism, legalism, legalism. Denominational spirits, lukewarm, Scientology. <laughs> really? Scientology's on the list? Okay. Confucianism. Are Jehovah's Witnesses on here? Please tell me they are. They are! Oh, I love it. Uh, white supremacy, KKK, anti-Semitism are on here too. Wait, is this under the list of things you're supposed to do or not supposed to do? Uh... Uh, in all fairness, it's the list of things you're not supposed to be involved in. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> then we got Leviathan. I do break the curse of Leviathan back to 10 generations on both sides of the family, and I destroy any legal rights or grounds that give evil spirits reason to operate. I destroy all of these in Jesus' name. Hindering spirits, monitoring spirits, pride, control, impatience, rebellion, vanity, Betrayal, self-exaltation, self-exaltation. Wonder what that one could be. Stealing, gambling, vandalism, slumber? You're not allowed to sleep? Laziness, idleness, complacency, distraction, stubbornness, irresponsibility. Wow, this is just a big list of things that are against his rules. You can't do these things if you want to be in his church. Worry is on the list. Paranoia. Oh boy, he's already broken it 16 times over. Paranoia is on the list. Jealousy, envy, slavery, strife, division. Where did he get all of these things from? Wow, this is... I come against every strong man and bind you in the name of the Lord Jesus. So these are like um, re recitations or recitations you're supposed to be doing. Supposed to be quoting what he says here and denouncing or rebuking everything on the list and he believes that there are actual demons out there that inhabit people and he has a list of the names legion okay legion was not a demon legion was a man that was um possessed by like a thousand demons and they all spoke as one and then jesus cast them into pigs and and drove them off of a cliff right so legion died is that right legion absalom belial Jezebel, Lilith, Delilah, 
Ahab, Rahab, Nimrod, Baal, Apollyon, Abaddon, Orion, Mammon, Horus. Is he just listing like old Egyptian gods right now? Beelzebub, Behemoth, Asmodeus, Water Spirit slash Mermaid Spirit? Really? Werewolf slash Vampire? All Serpent Spirits, all Scorpion Spirits, Cobra slash Black Mamba, Black Widow. Oh, boy, is this weird. Uh, uh, I command all demons of sexual perversion to get out of their bodies, their minds, and, and their sex organs in Jesus' name. Oh, boy. And on the list, nakedness. That's against the rules. Can't do that. If you do it, you're going to hell. No nakedness under any circumstances. Before taking your boxers off, you must put a shirt on. Then take the boxers off. Then put the boxers on. Then take the shirt off. Then put the shirt on. That's how you're supposed to get dressed because nakedness is a sin. Illegitimacy is on the list of sexual perversion. Illegitimacy. Okay. Feminism's on the list. Feminism is sexual perversion, apparently. Um, whoredom, whatever the hell that is. Okay. Sadism? Masochism? Harlotry. How are whoredom and harlotry different from each other? Fantasy is, is okay, transgenderism? Gender dysphoria? God, this is bizarre, dude. What the hell am I reading right now? Spirit spouses? Lewdness is on the list. Wow, dude. Okay, so I'm not reading everything that's on here, but they have really boring lives. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> unnatural affection. What the hell is unnatural affection? I mean, they already listed everything else in here. That Jehovah's Witnesses had a very specific interpretation of what unnatural affection was, which, which would be... I, I'm not saying them because of, you know the algorithm or whatever, but this one right here, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses interpreted unnatural affection to be. Lasciviousness? What the hell is lasciviousness? Promiscuity and sexually transmitted diseases are on the list of, of demons that can possess you, I guess, and defilement also. Heaviness. Wow, this is bizarre. Orphan spirit, abandonment, rejection, self-rejection, grief, neglect, outcast, loneliness, isolation, addiction. These are demons, presumably, that he wants... This is the deliverance manual. So he wants to exercise these demons. Everything that I've just listed is the name of a demon in his mind. Really? Let me show you what I'm talking about here. This is a, a clip from Greg Locke, early April 2022. He said this. Check this out. Now, I know what your doctor says, and I don't care what the news media says. I know what your doctor says. You know why some of you have demonic activity? You've given them legal authority because you believe the medical diagnosis. He's talking about COVID. Huh? You believe the medical diagnosis. You say, we have brother life. You're not a doctor. Nope, not even a nurse yet. I do have a PhD. Preach hellfire damnation every time I can. But I'm going to tell you something. Some of you have given the devil legal authority and grounds and rights to your life because you believe the medical diagnosis when a doctor looks you in the face and says, well, what you have is bipolar disorder. What you have is a spirit that needs to be cast out so you can have some peace is what you've got. Again, he was talking about COVID originally, I believe. He talked about it later in this clip, too. So he's saying COVID is a demon that is possessing people. And if you just go through an exorcism, then you'll be cured of COVID, apparently. Multiple personality disorder. It's demonization is what it is. 1,000%. I don't care what the newspaper says. This is just cringy, man. We see it every week. Did you know that we could go to a, a crazy house? Okay, hang on. Uh, I'm being told lasciviousness is being a horn dog. Okay. Never... I've heard the word. I just don't remember what it means. But uh, thank you for that definition. Is that the technical definition? Or <laughs> appreciate that. A crazy house. Right now. So he can go to like a mental institution, what he's saying. Well, he could if Reagan didn't shut them all down. Thanks for that. But okay. I'm talking about a, a padded party room. People slobbered on themselves. Can't feed themselves. Messing all over. Wetting all over themselves. Boy, this is a graphic description. Sales, moaning, screaming, crying, and all they do is keep them doped up on medication and keep them worse. 
Get him off that medication for about 45 hours and let me and the deliverance team walk up in one of them crazy houses with some Bibles and some anointing oil. And I'm telling you, we can cast out the spirit of multiple personality, insanity, madness, the lunatic spirit. Uh, okay, so you can cast all of these things out of people. Um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, the lunatic spirit? Because they're demons. They're, they're the names of demons. You see what I'm saying? That's what we're reading right now in this deliverance manual these are the names of demons the name of a demon is addiction alcoholism slash drunkenness has two names i guess pharmakia is the name of this other demon a any medicine you take any that means blood pressure medicine that means um metformin diabetic medicine anything tylenol even the demon of pharmakia is possessing you when you take medicine nicotine gluttony anorexia bulimia medication spirits video games slash entertainment oh i guess this demon has two names also video games and entertainment and then finally the demon of social media wow dude and here's the here are the death demons santeria destruction slash destroyer lucifer molek slash abortion <laughs> Molech is the god of abortion, apparently. Okay. Molech is actually, I believe, uh, one of the Canaanite gods from the Canaanite pantheon. You know, uh, pantheon is a set of gods that people believe in. Uh, there was a Greek and a Roman pantheon. We named our planets after them. I don't remember if it was Greek or Roman that we named the planets after. Okay, yeah, Roman pantheon, I believe. So um, Poseidon was from the Greek pantheon, the Greek set of gods. He's the god of the sea. Neptune was the Roman god of the sea and we named our planet neptune you know we named them after whatever so anyway uh the canaanites had a, a grouping of gods that they believed in too i believe marduk was one of them i think molech was also i could be mistaken yahweh was one of the gods i don't i think he was the god of metallurgy in the uh, canaanite pantheon yahweh was so anyway i think molech was also in the list baal is another one from the the uh the canaanite pantheon canaanites were just people that lived in israel around the same time that the jews lived in israel you know during the time that the bible was being written about the the set and setting and time and place that it was about um and the jews of the old testament like warred a lot with the canaanites but they also had a big cultural exchange. Obviously, they picked up a lot of gods from them and stuff. Okay, Moloch was a pagan deity before 1935, or, or so scholars thought, to whom child sacrifice is offered at the Jerusalem Tophet. Some modern scholars have proposed that Moloch may be the same god as Milcom, a dad or milky, or an epithet for Baal. And again, Baal was from the Canaanite pantheon, so Molech might actually be from the Canaanite pantheon. Anyway, the demon of misery is on the list. The demon of murder, torment, torture, visual, the demon of visual images. I am dead serious. That is on the list. The, the demon of visual images and of nightmares. Uh, there are demons of infirmity also. The demon of cancer, arthritis, allergies, food allergies is a separate demon, apparently. Blood disorders, thyroid disease, the demon of COVID-19. The demon of COVID-19 pneumonia is apparently its own demon also. And the demon of COVID-19 vaccine, which is responsible for all vaccine injuries, apparently. Okay. <laughs> God, dude, this guy. This is insane. The demon of migraines, stroke, heart disease, heart disease fibromyalgia. When I was... Uh, in college, I I remember hearing that fibromyalgia was it was questionable if it was real or not. Apparently, it is real. They've they've kind of come to the consensus that it is real. Interesting. It's a chronic pain syndrome that experts believe may be caused by malfunctioning malfunctioning nervous system. Interesting. It's not yet fully understood, and its symptoms can overlap with many other conditions. The demon of infertility. So, if you bring Greg Locke in and his deliverance team. They can, and you're infertile, so you had a hysterectomy. They can pray over you and regrow that, that bad boy. They can just regrow that uterus and suddenly you're fertile again. The deaf spirit. They can bring hearing back to deaf people if they just pray over you enough. Okay. The dumb spirit is on here. Awesome. Um, the gout spirit. Okay. The Tourette's spirit. The diabetes spirit. They misspelled it. D-I-A-B-E-E-T-U-S is actually how it's spelled. 
the scoliosis and back problems spirit. Apparently two different spirits or the same spirit with two different names, I guess. Okay. God, I, I, I want to stop reading this list, but I know I'm going to see some absolutely crazy shit on here again. <laughs> I cannot. Lyme disease is on here. Apparently, the, the spirit of Lyme disease. Why did he list that specifically? Couldn't he have listed Lyme disease under like, I don't know, the spirit of illness or something? Like, <laughs> Why Lyme disease very specifically? Uh, and then we've got arrested development. I renounce the medical diagnosis that gives demons legal authority over my life. The demon of insanity, of schizophrenia, of nerves, of PTSD, of trauma, of Alzheimer's. Oh, they can pray Alzheimer's away. Fantastic. The demon of bedwetting. So I told you the moment I stop reading this shit, it's going to get crazy again. The demon of bedwetting. No joke. The demon of bipolar disorder, of multiple personality disorder, of autism. Yeah, this is another one he's talked about, the demon of autism. He got a lot of pushback for that one uh, from his congregation. Oh, boy, they didn't like hearing that he believed that autism was a demon. But this is uh, from Jan late January 2022. Okay, check this out. This is him talking about autism. Again, major pushback from his church for this. Do not... Do not jump up right now and rebuke me for what I'm about to say. What if I want to? On three occasions, we're going to go through all of them, not today, thank God. On three occasions, kids were brought to Jesus. Not of their own will, of their own volition, but by their parents. Okay, so their parents forced children to come in and be baptized against their will. Am I reading this right? That had epileptic fits. Remember, epilepsy was on the list of demons, right? Anger issues. Outbursts of emotion. And because we've called it possession, parents refuse to deal with it. Are you telling me my kid's possessed? No, I'm telling you, your kid could be demonized and attacked, but your doctor calls it autism. Oh, boy, this made people mad. I love it. But your doctor's calling it autism. That is fascinating. But, I mean, I have to imagine he's got a, a pretty high percentage of autistic people in his church, right? Pro I mean, roughly representative of society, at, at least, I'd imagine, which is non-zero. And he has, um, I don't know, uh, maybe 600 to 1,000 attendees per week, I believe. So, yeah, that didn't make people very happy. I don't care if you stand or not. I don't care if you leave or not. I'm telling you, there's deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ for your children and their children's children. There's deliverance in that. I remember, deliverance means exorcisms. He's saying there, there's deliverance from demons. He's going to exorcise demons. Just crazy, dude. Crazy. The demon of ADHD. The demon of dyslexia. So you got dyslexia? You can just pray it away and it'll be gone. Somebody asked if spina bifida is on there as one of the demons. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, that, it, that's a little too specific. Although he got real specific with Lyme disease. But uh, yeah, not apparently. I, I, let's look it up. Let's see. Spina. Nope. Apparently that's not a demon. Who knew? Codependency is a demon. Chaos is a demon. And then just plain disorder just disorder hysteria is a demon apparently too irrationality obsessive compulsive disorder numbness hallucinations madness double-mindedness what does that mean the deliverance ministry of jesus and now they're quoting the bible verses god this is just crazy stuff dude it's like ramblings of a madman in in here yeah, they're just quoting a bunch of Bible verses here. I, okay, well, now they're apparently done quoting. I guess you're supposed to read this beginning to end. Biblical names and descriptions of demons. The dumb spirit, devils, lying spirit, haughty spirit, seducing spirits, spirit of bondage. Is it described in the Bible? Really? Okay. Spirit of fear. I mean, I don't think maybe that... You know what? I'm probably taking that a different way. I saw the sexual perversion one and you know just my mind is there i guess 
Evil spirits, foul spirit, unclean spirit, spirit of divination, of error. Spirit of error? Really? Okay. Spirit of jealousy, familiar spirits, perverse, uh, spirit of heaviness, of whoredoms, of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity. So if you're disabled, you just have to have Greg Locke pray over you and you'll no longer be disabled. The Beelzebub spirit, the Belial spirit, Lucifer spirit, Satan, Chamosh, Molech, Abaddon, Apollyon, Dagon, Behemoth, Leviathan, Orion, Legion, Red Dragon, apparently. My God, dude, these people, these people need help. And I love how at the end he he quotes a fake Bible verse that that was added after the fact. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They, they shall cast out devils. Most people who watch me probably already know this, but uh, the book of Mark, it was the first gospel to be written. It has 16 chapters in it. Now, the original manuscript that we have ends at verse 8. So the last chapter was describing Jesus dying and what happened after he died. It says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they could anoint Jesus' body. Basically, it says, but when they showed up, the tomb was open, the, the large stone rolled away. There was an angel, or there was a man in white sitting there, and Jesus' body was gone. And the man in white said, Jesus has gone into the city. It says, but go, tell his disciples, and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's how it ended. Women said nothing because they were afraid. That's it. Boom. The end. But decades later, people added to the book of Mark because they didn't like the ending. They thought it needed some pizzazz, something more. So they added verses 9 to verse 19. And uh, most Bibles, in fact, almost all of them nowadays, if you pull it up and you read that section, you'll see it says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. They're fake verses. They were added later. They should not be taken as real at all. They don't even follow the same theme or tone as the rest of the book of Mark. Like, in the entire book of Mark, Jesus is kind of a loving guy, happy-go-lucky, uh, hippie. Hates the rich, though. Boy, does he hate the rich. Loves the poor, loves the working man, that kind of thing, right? But in this, like, verses 9 to 20, he's... It's almost like he's hateful or vengeful. Let me just read a couple sections here. So it says, these are the verses that were added after the fact. When Jesus rose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who'd been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and she had seen them, they did not believe it. Um, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country he appeared to the eleven later as they were eating. He rebuked them. Anger. He's rebuking them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he'd risen. I mean, Jesus wasn't a rebuking kind, right? Doubting Thomas needed to touch the wounds to know for sure that this was real. Remember? Jesus wasn't a hateful, vengeful person. Why is he rebuking people? Yelling at them, treating them like shit for being, you know, for doubting somebody could come back to life. And then this is verse 15. He said to them, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This is the basis for the Pentecostal movement. These verses preach the gospel to all creation, soul winning or door knocking or uh, going in service as Jehovah's Witnesses call it. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Anger, vengefulness, hatred. They will be punished for their evil deeds of not believing that I came back to life. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. Fake verse, but again, the basis for exorcisms. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. They will drink deadly poisons, and it will not hurt them at all. The Pentecostals used to do this stuff all over the country. Snake handling, drinking poison, and it was made illegal. Snake handling specifically in every state except West Virginia, I believe. I think it's still legal in West Virginia to do snake handling. Yep, West Virginia is the only state that legally permits serpent handling. 
in religious ceremonies. And it's all based on this fake verse in the Bible, chapter or verse 18 of chapter 16 of Mark. They will pick up snakes with their hands. When they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. This is the basis for faith healing right here. After Jesus spoke into them, he was taken up into heaven. He sat at the right hand of God, so on and so forth. So the point here is that Greg Locke quoted a fake verse at the end of his exorcism manual. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils. You can't tell me he didn't know that like this is fake, right? How did he, how did he buy any of this? That the demon of pharmacia is a real thing. Really? Just ridiculous from top to bottom. Jesus Christ, dude. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. It just blows me away, honestly.